Hello, everyone. This is a big pleasure to be here. Thank you, all my fellow colleagues. I am Giovanna Graziosi Casimiro, also known by Gigi in the space. And I am a senior and XR producer in the Web3 space and also the head of Metaverse Fashion Week. And today, I have the honor to be the moderator of this panel to unveil many layers of the future of the internet. And the most important layer is the people behind it and our journey in this universe. So I would like to first of all invite our guests to introduce themselves and they are going to dive deep into the questions of today. Hello everyone, very uh, excited and pleased to be with you today. So I'm Stephanie Bretonnier, the CEO of Forestry and We Impact that World. So just very briefly, I use... <laughs> Thank you. Used to work during 15 years in the corporate and luxury beauty and fashion industry. Then uh, I had to deal with a brain stroke that changed my life. I decided to make my dream come true and travel the world during two years. And then because freedom was my luxury, uh, I opened several, I founded several startups. And uh, today I'm here to talk about technologies, but you know, with purpose. How can we leverage technologies for impact? So hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Leanne Elliott Young. I'm CEO and co founder of the Institute of Digital Fashion. Um, we birthed the Institute as an emblem for change. Uh, we believe in the IRL and URL fashion industries working together. Um, but primarily, it was about pushing through some of the pain points of the fashion industry, particularly in diversity, inclusion, and also sustainability. So, how can we put the people and the planet first? Hey, everyone. I'm happy to be here and really looking forward to sharing this panel with such incredible ladies and with you all. I'm Leila and I'm the Chief Metaverse Officer and a board member at Verse Estates. We're a technology company providing cutting edge solutions and also the founder of Ostras Women DAO, which is an initiative to help close the gender and funding gap in the tech and Web3 space. So we've built quite a, a a cool community of female founders, entrepreneurs, and investors. And uh, there's a lot of fa many females from all around the world. So through my work, I just want to make sure I contribute to building an inclusive metaverse and inclusive Web3. And yeah, to make sure we don't replicate the same mistakes as in Web2. Hi, I'm Andrea Abrams. Um, I am a retail and blockchain investor. And I was a fashion and retail executive for 20 years. So when I got involved in technology as an investor, I realized that there was a little bit of a disconnect between the technology and, and the real world activities that we were trying to affect. So I created FijiCode. I'm the founder and chief metaverse officer of FijiCode. A big part of what FijiCode does is we are an organization of networking. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with all the ladies on stage and we're gonna talk about this today, how the power of community has really uh, expanded with Web3 and particularly for female leaders. I'm also the chief of strategy for Faith Drive. Faith Drive is a platform created by a fashion brand, a traditional luxury fashion brand and it was created to provide access to independent designers and brands to the tools and capabilities that are available today, but sometimes financially inaccessible. And I'm very happy to be here with these four ladies that I know personally and work with and respect very much. Thank you, ladies. Uh, it's so beautiful to see a panel, not just with a variety of knowledge, but also with a cross-generation conversation, because I think when you talk about the future of technology, we sometimes uh, create silos of conversation. So today we're going to talk about many layers, many experiences and journeys of all of us. And I think inspired by the first uh, conversation of today with May, right? My first question, and starting with Andrea, then we can come back to me, is, who was an aspiring female figure in your inner circle that you remember that really made you go further and reach the success or the place you are today? So I think I have a, a, an unusual answer to this. You know, we always get asked about people who inspired us. Um, I actually can say the person that inspired me the most to make the bold moves I make today and the ability to be a leader, a, a business leader, is somebody I actually didn't like too much. It, she wasn't my friend, and she wasn't my favorite uh, leader in my organization. But when I worked for a very large public company in the U.S., she was one of the first people to reach a certain status in a very, very large multi-billion dollar company. But what inspired me about her is how she spoke about the business. And she always said to me, 
you always need to have people with experience, but you always best hire personality and you train skill. It's all about character and personality. I followed her career for many years, even after we didn't work together, and I realized that the lesson for me was you don't have to only have mentors or be inspired by people who think like you or look like you or work with you and they're nice to you. Some of the people that are sometimes antagonistic to you are gonna teach you the best lessons. And the best thing you can do is learn what makes them successful. And that could be a lesson for you. So I won't say her name, but it was somebody I worked with that, that really gave me that phrase 20 years ago and I never forgot and Gigi knows, the ladies know, for me, it's all about character and personality. You can always improve your skills. Thank you, Andrea. So, uh, for me, being an entrepreneur and having founded All Stars Women, I'm feeling very fortunate because I get to interact uh, with female founders and entrepreneurs like every day of my life. As you can see, just being on this panel today is like really inspiring. And just the fact that I can talk to them and I see how passionate they are, like it really drives me to push myself. And uh, I'm just really in awe of their determination. And uh, yeah, so I'm just I'm feeling very fortunate and blessed for that opportunity that I get. Uh, but I do have a story which stuck with me in particular since high school. It's the story of the first uh, female athlete. Uh, her name is Catherine Switz. And uh, she was actually the first woman to run the Boston Marathon, even though at the time it was exclusive to males. And um, I mean, she... She had a lot of obstacles that she had to overcome, and a lot of government officials and you know people tried to take her off the race. And at the time, it wasn't accepted for females to run; like they were considered too fragile to do any sports. And so, like she really persevered, and uh, her defiance to to these obstacles like paved the way for many more women to to take up the sport. So after in 1974, she went on to do a lot of a lot more marathons, and then she really like. Her legacy is really inspiring to me, and what I learned from her story is that nothing, nothing is impossible if you put your mind to it. Yeah, so for me, it's um, obviously I'm going to say my mother because <laughs> she was such a staunch female. But then, um, and it comes, this story comes rooted from my mother. So um, it's actually about Boudicca, who was a, a warrior woman who stood up against um, the Romans. Mm. Um, so she was a British pagan warrior. And, whoop! <laughs> and the reason um, she, the reason she, uh, she actually stood and felt she needed to fight and to rally um, a kind of uh, team together is because her, her daughters were raped. And then at that moment, um, her husband was also murdered by the Romans. And at that point, she couldn't inherit any of the wealth, any of the property. So I think that comes really to, you know, like where we are today and what, what we all believe in, this whole thing of standing up against adversity to the point of your, to challenge what you yourself and what, is deemed by society where, where, you, where you can go and what you can do. And I think we do that a lot with IODF. We've got six industry world first and they're all because of the, the industry wasn't listening. So we always push to the nth degree and jump over the hurdles that are put there by society. Amazing. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you. For me, it's obviously Jane Goodall. I don't know if you know her, but she's a, a very famous and amazing scientist. She went uh, and she left um, Great Britain uh, during the 60s, left for Africa and wanted to, uh, you know, solve the problem of, uh, you know, the environmental impact and uh, yet at that time and the fact that uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of animals, especially gorillas and, and uh, and uh, monkeys were killed uh, in that region. And she wanted to study because it was also very interesting to study, you know, the behavior of, uh, of the gorillas. Uh, and she find out and she emphasized the fact that as a woman and why woman, the way that, you know, scientists deal with how can we bring and, and do and, and make impact, sorry, um, within that region was not focusing on, on the environment first, but understand why local people were behaving that way. And 
the way that uh, former uh, scientists analyze the situation is, oh, it's cultural, you know, we can't do anything with that. But she emphasized the fact that if you bring some economies within the region, because those people were killing animals because this was the only way for them, you know, to survive. So if you bring some, in, and if you develop the economies within the region, you are able to empower those people and they are able to afford to, you know, pay regular food. And then what is important is to bring education, to educate the next generation. And only then you are able to, you know, start and make an impact on the environment. So the way she dealt with that, it was a dis disruptive way to analyze a situation. And this is for me the principle of, you know, what we should do currently because we have to deal with so many transformation and so many crises at the same time. Amazing, thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> I'll quickly say mine, so I can share also. <laughs> Aside from moms, grandmas, and all the resilient women that we see every day doing everything, right? I think that um, I had the privilege to be in the academic world, which allowed me to be always mentored by female professors. And I think they gave me the sixth sense in the research, and I think that's always quite inspiring. So thank you, ladies. Next question is gonna go back to Stephanie, who was already talking, and now let's dive into the, the future of the internet and all the business opportunities. So you have been in the corporative world for a long time, luxury industry, 100 women of Davos, so many things that you already did, and you saw the transition from Web 2 to Web 3, right? Which is not yet ready. Uh, so what do you see as how these technologies can impact real businesses? Because I'm sure we have many entrepreneurs here in the audience. Actually, uh, um, I've been dealing exactly with the same situation 15 years ago uh, with the emerging, uh, at that time we call, uh, we call it uh, digital technologies, which was you know, social media and e-commerce. And people were emphasizing the same fears, the same resistance to change, and the fact that yeah, this was for only for big groups who can afford it, uh, but smaller organization, you know, they, they didn't have the skill, they didn't have the, uh, you know, the, the, the budget for that. But 15 years later, we had to deal with COVID and everybody, you know, understood and, uh, and realized, you know, the impact of not having developed uh, this uh, digital transformation. Right now, uh, what is really important is the fact that everyone is focusing still on, you know, big companies and how, you know, these big corporate leverage technologies. But I'm really uh, concerned about, you know, the fact we are repeating the same mistakes. Just to give you some insight, which emphasize the importance of, you know, embracing the change and leveraging technologies, not for the purpose of, you know, having, being hype or having new technology for your business, but it's a matter of survival. Just to give you some numbers, um, the World Economic Forum revealed uh, in December that our global economies rely and depend on uh, 332 million of SMEs, which represents 70% of the job on the globe and 70% of the economies. So if we do not empower every single small and medium organization with you know, those new technologies, we are going to deal with a much bigger crisis, not only for the economy, but also for our planet, because for me, it makes no sense to create silos between technologies and impact and sustainability transformation. And I'm going to, you know, comment on that later, but it's, it's absolutely important that every single organization embrace those technologies step by step. But the thing is, you know, the impact of, you know, blockchain, Web3, metaverse is going to be so huge that all the businesses who are not, um, you know, who have not started, you know, this journey as soon as possible, they are going to struggle really much because we've been dealing with a digital transformation and you had 15 years to make that shift. We are not having 15 years to make the Web3 transformation. That is 
obvious. Why? Because you know, those technology brings a lot of benefits. Not only it will empower you and enable you to uh, leverage new revenue streams, but on top of that, we will solve you know, the problem of trust. You know, the problem is everybody is you know, manipulating, let's say, data just to, uh, to write the next uh, press release and so on. And the thing is, we have a true problem of lack. And the biggest risk for any single organization right now, it's not economic crisis, it's not technology transformation, it's not sustainability, it's reputation. Mm -hmm. And your reputation can be preserved only if you're able to prove your impact because there is too much blah, blah. Right. And the reason why I like so much this region is the vision is super clear. The ambition are so high and you turn vision into concrete actions. And the point is we have to, make in, to, to put in place you know, a system that enables every single organization to prove the impact they're bringing to the society. Amazing, Stephanie, thank you. And I think you mentioned about the metaverse, and of course, uh, our lives are being more and more hybrid, right? Because we, we share our identities in different spaces. And I would like to bring Leila, who is such a young entrepreneur, but has been making a huge change and impact in the virtual world's business. And I would love, Leila, that you share with us a little bit how, how was that journey for you, your challenges? Explain a little bit more what is a virtual world and, and what you have been building so our amazing audience can know more and how they can dive in these virtual spaces. Yeah, sure, thank you so much. Well, uh, so far I'm grateful because my journey has had its ups and downs, but it's been quite positive and I've learned like a lot. I've learned a lot more in the last three years than I have in in the last 10 years before that. So I guess one of the biggest uh, like lessons that I've learned over my journey, uh, so I founded a few companies, like I come from a FinTech background. So when I was at university, at the beginning of my university, I was working on a FinTech platform with one of my best friends. And uh, I would say like the biggest lesson I learned is to really be careful about who you associate yourself with in business. Uh, I'm saying like, and my dad even taught me, uh, who you're associating yourself in business with is like going into marriage with them. And uh, if you associate yourself with the wrong people, it can actually like really hinder on your progress. And uh, it can actually like prevent you from reaching your goals. So I would say like really make a thorough due diligence Always make a due diligence on who's on your network and who you associate yourself with because reputation really follows you, as uh, Stephanie was saying. And uh, I would also not advise to get into business with your friends. I mean, even though it feels like the natural thing to do, uh, there is no such thing as, you know, we're friends, we're going to go based off on trust. Uh, because sometimes these mistakes can be quite costly. So I would say, like, no matter what you do, even if they're your, like, all-time childhood friends, always make sure you put everything like in contract and in written form because this will always serve you well uh, in the future because, you know, numbers get lost and things, you know, get smashed up together. So definitely I, that, that's the, the most valuable advice I would give you. And the second thing is I noticed that a lot of, uh, I mean, women, like we, like sometimes we don't, um, I would say to always make sure that you build a, a strong network, always get out of your comfort zone, like don't be afraid to come up to people and, you know, like always have an open mind and try to, you know, really build a strong network because you're always going to be able to leverage your network in the future. So that's kind of like my, my journey, what I would advise. I hope you took notes. <laughs> Thanks, Leila. Andrea, let's talk a little bit about you, such a powerful lady boss in the corporative world uh, that dealt with so many investment funds, retail, your career is really extensive, especially in a male-dominated world, right? So I think when we talk about opportunities, it's always about how we female can really trigger opportunities and open doors for others. So tell me, in your opinion and through your journey, how we can bring accessibility in the world of tech for females and what are the challenges that this space presents today for all of us? 
First, I think um, the industry itself is more open because the technology of Web3 is all about access, right? So I talk a lot around the world about the access that we now have in the fashion industry, for example, to talent from all over the world. But from a business perspective, what we can do for access, Layla is a perfect example. I met Layla a few years ago when she was just launching the FinTech um, platform and she was in college. In the old days, when I was Layla's age, we did not have those opportunities. You couldn't call the CEO of a company and network so easily because there were so many barriers and it was designed to be hierarchical. And if in a lot of industries, you were told it was not about you, it was about the company. And it's not about your personality of what you have to say. And so for me, in a way in which I'm seeing, um, again, what I said earlier, higher personality, higher character principles, of course you need the skills. When we founded Fijicode, we had a really clear vision of starting with C-suite people from fashion and retail involved in the physical and digital aspects of, of, of the business. I met Layla and I said, you know, you don't fit the criteria of what we're looking for in terms of age or experience, but you have the right character, you have the right vision, you have your DAO you were launching, and she became our youngest member, she still is. And I wanna amend my, my answer from, from early on. Young ladies like Leila inspire me. I know why we were put on a track 20, 25 years ago, and it was very difficult. We had different barriers. Today, the barrier is overexposure. And so when I find young people who have to deal with the challenges of having Web2, social media, distractions, too much thrown at you, right? It's not just your education. It's, it's, it, you have all these influences. Finding the right balance is very important. So what I try to do to inspire women is to say, we're all very busy. We don't all have extra time but our organizations can make things available. And I try to work with organizations of people of all ages, different parts of the world, to provide that access. And I expand my, my network so my network can be available to them. That was not possible before because of technology was not available and it was not possible because culturally it was not acceptable. So I tell all the young ladies here today and young men, because I think this was the same for men, um, the world is more prepared for you to make bold moves. Don't be afraid to approach people. Don't be afraid to say, this is what I wanna do. If you have the discipline, if you have the interest, if you work hard at it, anybody can do anything they wanna do in this world. Amazing. Thank you, Andrea. Leanne. Hi. How are you doing? Good, good. <laughs> I have a question for you, and I think that's, that's very much where you are at in terms of uh, impacting the world, right? When we think about the future of the internet, virtual worlds, the metaverse, a lot has to do with our presence in that virtual world. How our bodies, how our souls will exist in those spaces, how we're gonna communicate our identities. You have been in that discussion for a long time. So I would love to hear from you, how do you see the identity building process in that space, right? And what that represents for you and how everyone can be part of that journey of rebuilding, reshaping their identities. Yeah, so it's something that was, is really important to what we do at IODF. So we actually, we've worked with lots, we work with lots of luxury brands from Caring, LVMH, PVH, but also some support emerging designers. We have an IRL, URL Academy, which assists them moving into the digital landscape. Um, when we were having uh, meetings with uh, various luxury brands, we were talking about this point of identity. And lots of times um, we were told, okay, when creating an avatar or a virtual world's identity experience that perhaps everyone can just be blue and we were like okay no that doesn't really service everyone and we were fed up of kind of pushing back so we wanted some real data behind that so we delivered a, um, a white paper which was research with over 6,000 participants and small focus groups on the back of that data we found that 69% of people felt underrepresented in the virtual sphere which is quite a crazy statistic um, and then also that pronouns were super important. Again, 62% pronouns are important in that space. And when you talk about virtual identity, you assume that everyone wanted to be a kind of 
crazy metaverse alien version of themselves <laughs> with a fire breathing tongue. And actually everyone wanted to be seen. Yeah. So also as well, it was about religious garments, mm -hmm. like where are they in that space? So we produced with the Saudi council, the first Shayla and Gutra Agar. Um, one of my team members grew up in Abu Dhabi and felt that was something that we should bring into that landscape. Um, and we also made the world's first non-binary digital avatar asset mm -hmm. with Daz3D. Just to the point that these things are people, you know, if you're in a wheelchair within the focus group, we found that actually that person didn't want to walk again. Perhaps they wanted to fly, but uh -huh. first of all, they wanted to be seen. So I think it's all of our responsibility here as builders and you as um, citizens and possibly builders of this new metaverse space and reality is that we have to push for representation because we all deserve to be seen. Wow. Thank you. And I think now I have a question for all of you, and we can start from Stephanie. It's a general question, because I think when we talk about the future of internet, the metaverse, Web3, it feels so glamorous, it feels it's all doing fine, <laughs> or not. <laughs> but I think the question is about challenges, right? Not always things are working great, but it's still we have to find the strength to move forward. So my question to you is, when did you feel vulnerable? In which moments you feel vulnerable? And how do you find ways to overcome those challenges in a way that people can learn from you? So the first answer came to my, which came to my mind was, you know, uh, obviously when I had this brain stroke, because uh, my future was quite uh, uncertain. Um, but I will emphasize my journey uh, during my two years around the world, driving from one country to another and crossing, you know, all uh, uh, Saudi, UAE, Oman, and then uh, back to uh, Europe through Iran, Turkey. And we've spent, you know, eight months in Southeast Asia, crossing Africa from South Africa to, uh, to Sudan. And actually, you know, every day I felt vulnerable because every day was a challenge. Every day, you know, I had to deal with something I was not comfortable with. And I learned so much, you know, to move ahead within this uncertainty, which today really uh, gave me the strength to deal with the challenges that as every single, you know, entrepreneur I'm dealing with. Because even if we are on stage, and I'm sure that my uh, fellow colleagues are, I mean, would we agree with me? I mean, we all face, you know, uh, challenges. We all have to deal with a lot of difficulties, doubts, and especially as a woman, you know, we we'll sometimes, lack of confidence and during that trip I learned a lot about you know uh, who I am what I want to do what I want to bring uh, what is my mission you know today uh, and I just want to give back to all the people I've met who had nothing and give me so much and the thing is I truly believe the fact that you know when you are facing challenges you have two options Either you give up or either, either you know, you, you, you just focus on the solution and you move ahead. Great. Leanne. Um, I think, yeah, as a, as a woman in this kind of tech space, is that there's obviously lots of patriarchal structures. Um, we're in the middle of a fundraise right now, so we're raising 15 million with VC, and we quickly pivoted to angels after lots of really intense rounds. Um, and through that whole process, I've never had imposter syndrome in my life, come from very bold parents that supported me, an amazing friendship group and peers that have always supported me. But in through those incremental moments, I felt as though was did I have was my value enough to be there is what we're doing does it matter enough and I think the key lesson for me was always that it is valuable what we what we are delivering and that your voice is important and um a little trick that um I do is number one I wear these ridiculous outfits and dark glasses <laughs> but um that we love yeah you just it's kind of like fake it till you make it like breathe deeply and really channel the person that you believe that you want to be speak slower 
speak louder and just feel, you know, really channel that. And so a lot of the time in these investment meetings when I'm drilling into numbers and having to have this hard vocabulary that um, I'm quite soft and, and humorous, but being hard in those spaces, I just channeled, you know, a different version of me. So quite performative, but I think it's okay to do that, you know, and just stick with what you believe in because your voice does matter. Amazing. Leila. So for me, actually, when I was in university, I kind of had my whole life planned ahead of me. And I was like, I had secured this job, like that was, you know, amazing. And I was like really looking forward to it. But in my heart, I always knew ever since I was little that I was made to be an entrepreneur. Like I've always wanted to go in that career path. I've always been like quite an artistic person. Like I've always, uh, I, th I think I'm quite creative. So it was quite, it was, I think the toughest challenge for me was to take that first step, was to start somewhere and know that I, at some point I can achieve what I want. So it took me a lot of willpower and you know, I, I, I kind of left my university and I quit the job. I didn't even show up the first day. And I, I started and I, I did All Stars Women, which, you know, I built it from nothing. And then I joined Verse and I joined the Verse like a, a month after it was made and it hadn't, it didn't have like any money in it yet. Um, but yeah, I guess that was my biggest challenge. And I, I would say like my, my advice for that and what I, when I look back at this experience, what I learned is to take the first step, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid to triple text people, don't be afraid to, you know, just follow your heart. If you feel in your heart this is what you have to do, don't be afraid uh, to skip on great opportunities because when a door closes, another one even better opens. Oh, wow. Andrea. So I think for me, so the ladies know, I. I was in a very fast environment, Wall Street driven era in a very male dominated industry in my 20s. And if you made it, if you were able to tolerate the pressure and you made it, you knew you couldn't stop. And uh, I was diagnosed with hip dysplasia at the age of 28. And part of my job was to be the head of international expansion for a multi-billion dollar, a $30 billion company. And so I thought that was the end, right? I know you talked about imposter syndrome. When you're the woman, you're always trying to say, okay, in those days, I was the girl developer. They used to call me the girl developer. Can't do that in the US anymore. Um, but I never looked at that as a negative. I was very proud of that because I never saw gender. I have a brother with Down syndrome, so I, I have so much respect for Leanne and what she's doing to use the technology to bring visibility. Visibility is gender, it's disabilities, it's geographic location, religion, it's all the things that sometimes make us think that we can't do something. How do we break those? So when I was diagnosed, I had to have surgery immediately. I was in a body cast for six weeks. I had to learn to walk again. I had been an athlete in high school and I had to learn to walk. My greatest fear was, even though legally I have a job when I'm done with this after three months, what's going to happen? I can't reinvent myself. And, and my father, my late father was a publisher. We, I grew up all over the world. I, I lived in Europe and South America before coming back to the US. And I remember my teachers always saying to me, the greatest thing you learn is adaptability. So I taught myself how to adapt to the new circumstances. And I said, this is not a challenge. I'm gonna find great people that I know can be team members to me while I'm gone and that are not going to backstab me. The fear is you're gonna be backstabbed and somebody's gonna take it as an opportunity to take your job. You build a team. We all have something to add. So never feel that you have to, it's all or nothing. Life teaches you humility. I don't care who you are, how much money you have, how much education you have. Something happens that shows you that we're all weak and we're all the same on this planet. So. For me, it was starting over to continue that career while learning to walk, while dealing with, you know, rebuilding myself, learning to take care of myself, and at the same time, learning to be a leader. It wasn't about me anymore. It was about how good a team could I build before I went in for surgery. And I, even today, I have moments when I feel, I think we've all voiced this, can I do this? What I always tell people in my team, 
everybody is fighting a battle you don't know anything about. No matter how strong you are on the outside, we're all human. If somebody is angry or yells at you, that says more about maybe what they're living with that day that they're not going to speak about. So a gentle, humble approach always works. And always find a way, like Leanne said, to tell yourself you're good enough. I now have this that was given to me by my husband, is a superwoman. I've had a lot of things to deal with and I tell myself, this is who I am. I take it with me to all the important events. And I said, you know, I know who I am and I know I can do this. And what I cannot do, I'm gonna build a team because that's what I'm here for. And what's my legacy is the people I can inspire and help so that they can help me bring access to other people. Amazing. Ladies, it seems our time is running out and we'll have to do a wrap. But before we wrap, I have one last question. Please, organization, just let me do this final one. Um, we have many entrepreneurs here. If they want to enter the Web3 space very shortly, what would be your advice, Stephanie? And then the team follows. Um, for me, it's, first of all, the purpose. Define the purpose. Define why you want to leverage those technologies. Because otherwise, uh, you won't get you know, the full benefits of those technologies. So, um, yeah, that would be my advice. And I have a favor to ask you. Because the first step is always for what I heard from many CEOs and, uh, and founders of SMEs is, yeah, I understand. I, I got the point. But how do I start? So this is a mission of WeImpact.World. Instead of you know, reinventing the wheel, we just provide proven you know, frameworks, playbooks to support, especially SMEs, you know, to enter into uh, technologies and to you know, st start their sustainability transformation. And this will have an impact not only on their business, because you can't, you can't uh, move forward if you don't bring growth. But very briefly, yeah. Please share with me, go on LinkedIn, share with me your problem, and I will make sure we provide you, you know, some solution to help you to make the first step. Amazing. Leanne. Um, I'm going to I'm going to mimic that because it is the why um, in we launched IODF in 2020 um, and then the pandemic hit um, the greatest idea I ever had. Um, but the point was everyone, all the fashion industry wanted to make uh, catwalks um, and, you know, and we asked why. I think that technology shouldn't be the solve. It shouldn't be, a, it's a layer that allows you to, get, to give more. Technology should be behind the scenes to activate and to solve your problem. So think of the why rather than the, the Great tech Great answer. <laughs> Leila. I would say always push yourself outside of your comfort zone. And for me, the way I do that and always keep myself in check as an entrepreneur, maybe tomorrow, this week or next month, Try to go by yourself to an event or networking story or any event where there's a lot of people and you don't know anyone. Go by yourself and see how you do. And then that way you can really prove to yourself. And I always do that and it you know, always you know, helps me stay out of my comfort zone, but that's one advice or like kind of homework I would give you. Amazing, thank you. Andrea. So I think everybody said uh, technology is here to solve a problem. So what problem are you trying to solve? I agree with everyone. Whatever industry you're in, uh, in Fiji Code, we focus precisely on that. So a lot of the activations you're going to see from us is using the technology to connect traditional designers, even metaverse for good, people with organizations that can use the technology to combine with the people who are very well versed in the technology today. So we're mixing neo designers from all parts of the world with designers from traditional fashion. We're working with organizations that use the technology to then bring attention to physical brands that are helping um, provide jobs, identity, and, and support to, to a lot of women's organizations in Latin America. And the best way for me, I, I agree with Leila, um, networking, going to events. What I find sometimes is we speak at events and I always wonder, do these people feel like they can't contact us? So thank you, uh, Stephanie, for mentioning that. If you follow, LinkedIn is a platform that I personally use to bring updates of what's happening. You may find things about Web3 that maybe you didn't think affect your industry or what you do. Um, we get a lot of messages and our teams are busy. So when you message us, follow us and message saying, I saw you at this event. I'll remember because yes. I'm only telling you 
who are here, and we will know, and someone will respond, and we will get in touch with you, because this is how a lot of us met each other. So yeah, we were talking about that backstage, the pain points of LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone, thank you so much, ladies. The Web3 and the Metaverse is limitless, so we hope to see you there with us. Join us, and that's our wrap. Thank you.